Hey everybody, it's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of You Know What? The Michael Shermer Show brought to you by Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. There it is, the latest issue on culture wars. Oh yes, we are all over it. Cancel culture and wokeness and all the kind of censorship we've been experiencing. And look, we have an article here called The New Archaeology Wars. Who's that by? Elizabeth Weiss, our new the returning champion for the show here. How cancel culture and identity politics have corrupted science. Here is her new book, On the War Path. <laughs> what a title, Elizabeth. My battle <laughs> with Indians, pretendians, and woke warriors. Let me give you a proper introduction here. You are a controversial and world renowned anthropology professor specializing in the analysis of human skeletal remains. For much of her career, she was based at San Jose State University, where she curated one of the largest collections of skeletal remains in the United States. She's the author of numerous books and articles, and she played an essential role in bringing the Smithsonian's traveling exhibition, What Does It Mean to Be Human?, to the San Francisco Bay Area. She's been featured in the New York Times, Science, USA Today, and Skeptic, <laughs> and has been interviewed on Fox News and Newsmax, and she currently lives in New York City, where she holds a visiting fellowship with the Heterodox Academy that was founded by our friend Jonathan Haidt. Welcome back. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, okay, now I have to ask you something serious here, um, Elizabeth. This is a very serious show, uh, and you have to have a lot of intellectual energy. So I need to know, are you menstruating or are you pregnant or anything that's going <laughs> to cause a, a weakness in your cognitive functioning? And no, nothing like that. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> you want to explain to our listeners what the hell I'm talking about there? <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that uh, has that I came across multiple times in the woke archaeology um, is these kind of menstrual taboos. And um, when I was writing my previous book, Repatriation and Erasing the Past, which came out in 2020, um, was probably the first time I saw these mentioned, including at field schools in, at UC Berkeley, uh, field schools come out of uh, UC Berkeley, for example, that worked um, with Native Americans. And they basically said that women who were menstruating could not engage in field work or even eat with their colleagues. Then when I wrote about these things and the cancellations um, started to hit me when whether it was you know a, an attack on my on the book repatriation and erasing the past or the uh, Society for American Archaeology deplatforming a uh, talk that I um, gave to the annual conference one of the first things that my university did um, to keep me um, when they were keeping me out of the collection was to insert in the protocols for access to the collection that menstruating personnel will not be allowed into the curation facility. And now we see that this same issue is arising again across the pond at the Pitt Rivers Museum. There's issues about should women be allowed to handle certain artifacts or even see them. Um, this kind of uh, liberal them, um, sexism is anathema to feminism, in my opinion, and it's just amazing how often this kind of uh, this kind of nonsense comes up. Seems like a monstrous reversal of the progress we've made since, say, the 1950s, where you might have heard something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or like I think in the 1920s or even at Harvard in 1890s, Naomi Oreski has a story in her book on the great myth. It's called about um, how male scientists and the Harvard male scientists in the 1890s said women can't come to Harvard. They can't get degrees because the blood being shunted away from your brain, you know, to your uterus for menstruation and all the rest, you know, it's just going to interfere with your cognitive abilities. I mean, but they had data like, oh, we have data. We could prove this. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. And it goes even beyond um, the universities in at the um, American Museum of Natural History here in New York, um, the curation facility has um, objects of power. Um, so basically objects that they think are sacred or powerful. And they warn women if they are menstruating or, um, or pregnant not to touch these objects. So, and that is still in place as we speak um, 
at the American Museum of Natural History. If you look at their, their objects of power guidelines for curators and researchers. Yeah, I have that quoting from your book here of the, the Northwest Hall, Northwest Coast Hall that they uh, right. overhauled. Spent, what, $19 million for, uh, updating this to include things like this. Caution, this display case contains items used in the practices of traditional Tlingit doctors. Some people may wish to avoid this area as Tlingit tradition holds that such belongings contain powerful spirits. <laughs> really. Uh, another one, do not approach if you're feeling discomfort. In other words, if you are in a physically or emotionally vulnerable state, including menstruation and pregnancy. I mean, this is 2023. I mean, what? What has happened? You know, it's a kind of a strange, um, you know, strange combination of, um, you know, liberal, liberals wanting to appease Native American um, super Na Native American beliefs and superstitions, and the Native Americans uh, thinking that these are the kinds of rituals and beliefs that were always held. Who knows really what beliefs were held in the past, um, considering that um, that they didn't have written language <laughs> prehistory. So what they it could just as well be that some of these menstrual taboos and some of these concerns were brought to them by, you know, Catholicism for all we know. And one of the interesting things is when you listen to um, like the beginning of repatriation committee meetings from the National Association of, sorry, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, um, NAGPRA, one of the things they start off with is always a prayer. And these are supposedly traditional prayers, but they include mentions of Jesus Christ. And, you know, so it's obviously not really a pre-Christian aspect. Um, and they've kind of married these kind of new age um, beliefs of animism with some, um, you know, backward sexist ideas <laughs> coupled with a little bit of Catholicism sprinkled in for good measure, <laughs> you know. And this is a, the type of beliefs that now anthropologists who don't want to offend Native Americans or First Nations in Canada or uh, Australian Aborigines, um, you know, the indigenous peoples of the world are kowtowing to. And, you know, I, I said, you know, just the other day, we c there was mention of the Pitt Rivers Museum in the UK having some of these same um, concerns and deciding that um, not to put images of certain masks in their digital database um, that so that um, you cannot see them. Um, and one of the interesting things is that these masks actually were from Nigerian um, cultures like the Igbo, but they have for the whole collection of Native American um, medicine material uh, warnings as well. So it's kind of this indigenous backward um, way of thinking that there's this, you know, we have to keep women away from it. And it, unfortunately, um, there's no pushback from the people who should be should be pushing back anthropologists, archaeologists, and um, and curators of those collections. Yeah. Remember when I was first debating creationists back in the 80s, you know, one of their arguments was, you know, equal time in the classroom for our, like, young earth creationists or old earth creationists and later intelligent design theory should be taught side by side, you know, let the students decide or whatever. Well, okay, well, what about all the Native American creation stories and the uh, Australian Aborigines creation stories? And the Hindu creation stories and the, you know, and so on. You could just go down the line. You could spend the entire semester covering nothing but that. That makes it pretty clear. But now, in a way, I guess in a postmodern perspective of science where all narrative stories are equal in terms of their truth value, you would really actually have to do that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, depending on where you are, it depends on which narrative you're going to also have to give quote unquote equal time to and there's you know there's no doubt that some of these stories are interesting you know creation myths are interesting for a folkloric perspective from a yeah. cultural anthropo anthropology perspective just as 
other religious stories are interesting from that perspective, but they shouldn't be taught as science and people shouldn't be made to, you know, um, engage in rituals that, uh, you know, they don't believe in, especially not in a scientific setting. If I go into you know, a person's church I'm, and they tell me, okay, this is what we do here, <laughs> fine, but I'm not going to their church. I have no interest in doing that. And so I don't think that, you know, religious rituals belong in the labs or in the curation facilities. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess that that's the problem of taking narratives as truth and and sort of blending science with cultural studies, something like that. Let's go through some personal history since you you get, you get kind of personal in your book. I should I should know for the listeners that uh, you were on before for your repatriation book, and the way I discovered you was through your husband, Nick Pope. Yes. Nick Pope is the famous a ancient aliens talking head expert, and he was once part of the UK's Department of Defense, or whatever they called it there, uh, looking into Uf UFOs and UAPs and so on. And so I had him on the show, and, and I think we got talking about political correctness or something, and he said, well, if you want the story, you should talk to my wife. Who's your wife? Elizabeth <laughs> Weiss. Who's that? I kind of vaguely remember the archaeology story. And yeah, so that's how I met you. And then in, in when I was talking to you, you told me the story of Philippe Rushton. You were married to Philippe Rushton. Yeah. And then that came up again when I wrote in defense of Ed Wilson, who after he's died, of course, because he can't respond, he got accused of being racist. Or even saying, you know, maybe Philippe Rushton's ideas should at least be analyzed to see where he's wrong. But, oh, no, you know, there's certain ideas that are taboo. Anyway, so I ended up not including that whole story about you and, and, and Philippe Rushton because I didn't want Philippe Rushton to be the point of the story. It was Ed Wilson right. is not a racist point of the story. But that's incredible that, you know, so let's use that as a, a starting off point to talk about why certain ideas are taboo. They, you, you can't even debunk them. They shouldn't even be talked about. Yeah, I, I think it is uh, quite interesting that there are these taboo topics. You know, of course, um, Phil, he studied race differences, and this was a taboo. Um, but, um, you know, uh, Nick d is not a researcher. He's, you know, he's basically a, a writer and um, entertainer. <laughs> um, and um, But still, you know, the question of, you know, alien life, it maybe has a lot of stigma related to it. And it, I'm like a complete skeptic when it comes to all of the UFO stuff and alien stuff. Like, you are? We completely, <laughs> we yeah, you mentioned we it in completely the book. disagree about that. Um, but, um, you know, every, you know, topics shouldn't be on a taboo, um, shouldn't be off the table. And one of the things that occurred to you know, occurred to me while I was working on my own uh, book, Repatriation and Erasing the Past last time, and this time, was how many topics have become taboo and how much more taboo they are than they used to be. So, you know, of course, Phil was very controversial, but he still, even when I, I was married to him, he was still presenting at conferences. I'm not even... I'm not even allowed on an anthropology conference now. Um, so in a sense, it's quite interesting that it's gotten more difficult to present, um, to present controversial ideas. After I was kicked off of the Society for American, um, Anth uh, American Archaeology Conference, and that was, I believe, in 2021, and my, my talk wasn't even that controversial. It was... Uh, we shouldn't use creation myths to make repatriation and reburial decisions, especially on uh, Paleo-Indians. So these are Native American remains or, or ancient remains that date 7,500 years or older, like Kenwick Man, who was about 8,500 to 9,000 years. I said, you know, if we're going to do repatriation, um, we, we need to base it on, on scientific research and uh, historical research in cases but, um, but we shouldn't do it on creation myths. I didn't think that this was really controversial, quite honestly. I thought that people would disagree with me in this normal sense of academic disagreements, but I didn't think I was going to be deplatformed for it. 
Um, and what they basically did, um, the Society for American Archaeology basically um, deplatformed the talk, but then they changed the rules to ensure that nobody who questions any aspect of reburial laws can ever come back on onto the program. So they literally had like a committee to change the rules for that. So that is now a taboo topic. Another common taboo topic now is the issue of um, se the sex binary. One of the, my last cancellations um, was on um, the issue of males and females. I was supposed to talk at the American uh, Anthropological Association, the AAA, and my talk, again, I didn't think it was that controversial, was um, about um, sex differences in the skeleton. So I said, I think my title was something along the lines of um, make no bones about it, sex in skeletons is binary, people may not be. And so the talk was framed as, you know, we can only identify male and female in the skeleton. Um, we're, we're not looking at gender in, in bones, we're looking at sex. And yet, since anthropology also includes forensic anthropology, maybe there are some clues in forensic cases, so modern cases, not ancient, where people have undergone surgery, like feminization surgery, um, that would appear in bones. And so I reviewed some of that research and I got canceled for that, which I again thought this is not a particularly controversial take on it, but um, it is now taboo to even ask whether you can say um, sex is binary in physical anthropology, not even just in cultural anthropology, but literally in physical anthropology, um, the American Association, the American Biological uh, Anthropological Association, uh, I think that's how it goes, the A, uh, AABA, I believe it is, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists, um, they put out a statement basically saying that sex, sex, not gender, but sex is not binary. And they basically blamed colonialists for destroying the sex spectrum and anthropologists. So, you know, the colonial anthropologists have uh, brought on the sex binary. <laughs> um, and so this is yet another taboo topic. Now, it may not be taboo in the sense of you can still get your, you know, your work um, in some online forums and so forth. But if you try to publish it in the American Journal of Biological Anthropology, I guarantee you it will be rejected. And so that's another thing we're seeing is that the, the top journals of the field are basically censoring all, uh, you know, what they view as controversial or taboo topics. Are we to believe that 19th and 20th century anthropologists like Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict or up to Napoleon Chagnon, you know, the old school where you go, go and live with these indigenous peoples and record everything they do, that those people had a biological sex spectrum and that the anthropologists brought with them their binarity, if that's a word, of, <laughs> of, of Western culture and imposed that on them in their uh, ethnographic reports? Yeah, I think that, that it's part that and part that physical anthropologists looking at skeletons basically were only splitting them into male, female. That's the other part. But I do think that there's a heavy emphasis on the ethnography of it and that, that yes, anthropologists going into these communities, whether it is living with them or um, studying them or studying their remains, brought the sex binary. And we just know, we know this is not true, but now this is what the American Association of Biological Anthropologists are saying in their statement about sex. That's their official position statement. I'm not sure that they should have a physical, that have a official position on a topic that is debatable. You know, it's, um, it's one thing to have a position statement about um, you know, human rights, for example. But it's another thing to have a position statement about uh, a current scientific debate. And that's um, one of the things that 
we're seeing we you know they have a position statement on sex um i don't know i think they have a position statement on race um is another one and you know one of the things that people sometimes confuse um with in anthropology physical anthropology looking at bones is like when anthropologists don't necessarily say okay this is for sure a female or this is for sure a male they think oh well that's because of the spectrum but it's not it's just because we are not that you know we're not 100% uh, perfect at identifying sex by bones i mean there's a whole there's everything else about the body too that gives clues but the other thing is that sometimes remains are not complete that just our inability to draw that conclusion does not necessarily mean that sex is on a spectrum you know yeah. so well so if you found utsi the ice man or the kennewick man what are you supposed to say now this is the utsi the ice person or kennewick person because we don't know how he or it or they identified i mean yeah. it's just you either have the wide pelvis or you don't, right? I mean, this is one right. of the big. Is this one of the big obvious ones? This is one of the big obvious ones, and um, one of the ways that they're g getting around this is whenever there are artifacts that don't match what we think the sex should match. So let's say you find a female skeleton with a, um, an artifact that you would associate with males. They're saying, oh, maybe this is a trans individual. Maybe sh this person identified differently. But quite honestly, maybe they just didn't have um, s their artifacts so neatly divided by sex, right? Or maybe the activities that they did weren't as clearly mar demarcated with sex. The, the sex aspect has to be the indie dependent variable. It doesn't change because of the artifacts. The artifacts are the dependent. So we have to use the biology to re to help us understand what their culture was. We don't use the culture to understand their biology. And I think that that's a big confusion in anthropology and archaeology today. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. When we first covered the anthropology wars in the 90s, this was uh, when Napoleon Chagnon was attacked that uh, journalist Patrick Tierney published that book, uh, Darkness in El Dorado, accusing Knapp of, of like planting uh, weapons or, or staging conflicts so he could uh, describe the Yanomamo as warrior-like and even faking his data or even intentionally giving them uh, Western diseases. I mean, you know, and he was acquitted of all that. I mean, there were investigations and pretty much none of that was true. Um, but the underlying theme seemed to be any implications that biology matters? That is, you're not a blank slate. There, there is some inheritability, heritability of human behavior, and 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 therefore, at least some of what <laughs> these people are doing it has to do with their genetics. Uh, that was what was taboo at the time. Yes, and it still is. Anthropologists, in some ways, are still. Um you know, blank slaters, right? <laughs> um, and one of the interesting things is, you know, w throughout my years as looking at bones, I, I've kind of had three different types of research. One is, you know, trying to reconstruct the past. What is What were those people's lives like? You know, whether it is, um, you know, a 5,000-year-old uh, skeleton like Otzi, or you know California Amerindians. So I just like what was it? What were their lives like? What were they doing? What did they die of? What were made? You know, how long did they live? Things like that. Another area of of interest to me is where do we find cross cultural patterns? So things that happen that, that are similar from depend independent of time and space, right? So that you find the same pattern in an uh, Amerindian as in a, a, you know, bog body, for example, right? And I think that when you find a consistent pattern that is, that is not bound by time and not bound by culture or geography, then you're really looking at something biological. 
And this is one of the things that I point out in, in many of my works and um, is one of the things that the sex difference, uh, why sex difference makes sense to look at the skeleton. Because regardless of what skeleton you look at, you can use the same traits to determine what is a male and what is a female. And therefore, it must be biological and not, you know, culturally driven. If it was just that the, you know, colonialists or the old anthropologists came in and said, well, you know, we're going to split this group up into males and females, um, then, it, then sex identification by bones wouldn't work. It wouldn't work in every culture. And it does work in every culture because mm. it's biological. Mm. Interesting, yeah. As you know, Steve Pinker makes the point that there can't be a blank slate because the culture has to operate on something. And that something is a physical brain. And that brain is designed and built uh, out of proteins by genes that code for them. And so there has to be some interaction. Of course, it's both. Um, but he also points out that it, it, it's even wrong to say genes make, make, make you do things. Genes, are, they're just molecules inside cells. It's the, it, there's many steps in between. They're coding for protein chains and chemical changes or whatever, and it's those things that drive behavior. Anyway, just kind of clarifying that. Um, okay, so you have uh, you talk about your history in here. You get your PhD, and you get the dream job. You get the Pope job, <laughs> tenure track <laughs> position. Oh my God, what a great what a great life, right? And so you're going along, and then all of a sudden things started changing even more dramatically than what I've been describing in the 1990s. Yes, and it's quite interesting. I got my position at San Jose State in 2004, and it was my dream job. It, you know, it was a tenure track position. Um, I was, um, because I was really the only physical anthropologist in the department, I got to um, shape the cur curriculum as I saw fit. And I had a huge skeletal collection to study. You know, so more than 300 individuals, some of them were so complete that, you know, you had all 206 bones um, from the human body, right? So I, and I remember very, um, you know, I remember my job interview and um, they, you know, they always ask you, what, what would you need to have a successful career here? And I was like, I actually just need the, some calipers and a little bit of time and the collection. That's it, you know? Um, and, and I really enjoyed that aspect of my job, you know, studying the skeletal remains. It's a fantastic collection. Um, and I brought students in to work with me, volunteering, um, students who volunteered on weekends, you know, staying all day Saturday and Sunday, just looking at skeletal remains and um, learning about bones. And I even, you know, did my best to ensure that scholars from all over the world were able to access the collection. One of the first things I did when I was at San Jose State was to write up a list of protocols that would make it easy for those who want to study the collection to come to San Jose and do so. So I was very much uh, active in promoting the research on um, the collection. And they were very happy with me, even though they knew my position of, uh, against the reburying of bones was already controversial. You know, Kennewick Man was found in 1996, and that kind of really um, set the, the battle, so to speak, with about whether remains should be reburied or curated. And the major law um, about reburying bones of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was passed in 1990. And I had already written about um, my concern about this, about the law, and about my concern that collections would be reburied, um, and how, and I had even, you know, given them one of these articles in the package, in the, um, you know, the, the application package. So they knew full well my position and they acknowledged that it was controversial, but it was not an issue in the sense that, you know, I was, um, 
you know, I was doing well. Um, they were happy to promote um, promote me both in my career, but also promote my ability to write about these issues until 2020 when my book Repatriation and Erasing the Past came out. And that's why it's kind of interesting that in a way, um, you know, some people might say, oh, well, you know, she probably just waited until she got tenured and then she let, it, let them have it. But it, that's not how I am. Uh, people who know me um, would recognize that I really, I'm very open and I would not, not have been able to um, do that, even, you know, so to hide it. Um, so something, ha something changed. And I think what changed was there was a real shift from like, you know, the political correctness of the 90s that um, included like multiculturalism and um, some inclusivity and, you know, a diversity of opinions. And so like a political, with some taboo topics, of course, but still there was like, you know, it was much less than now to basically the wokeness of the 2020s or it's maybe starting 2015 or 2016, you know, which basically went from being politically correct and challenging people to canceling people. I think that that was a big shift. And so when my book came out, um, there were, you know, almost immediately there was a uh, concerted effort to get me canceled and fired. And that effort came from all around the world um, to, uh, straight into my department as well, uh, from my chair all the way up to the university president. And this is really what on the war path is about in some ways is how this shift happened, but also my personal experiences with this cancellation culture and, and how I tried to fight back. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to that in a second. I was going to make a note about, um, your ex Philippe Rushton, um, James Flynn, the New Zealand psychologist uh, of the eponymous Flynn, Flynn effect, which IQ scores have been going up three points every decade or so for almost a century. That may be flattening out now. But in any case, uh, he, he was uh, of the mind that there are group differences in IQs. This is just objective data. It's just scores on a test. And he, his position was it's entirely environmental, entirely cultural. And that's the politically correct position to take. But by the time he wanted to publish his book about this uh, uh, maybe five years ago. He, he could not get a publisher. I mean, he's, he's like, look, I'm on the right side of history here. I'm on the right side of the argument. <laughs> and, uh, it, 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 and no, uh, he really started. He's world famous. I thought, wow, okay, this is really taboo. Okay, so now uh, back, back to the, uh, the, the kind of deeper root causes here. A lot of this seems to me, well, no, first off, I was going to ask you, why is it that it, you have to be fired. I mean, it, 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 you know, your life utterly ruined, your income taken away. Why not just, you know, we really disagree with you strongly and I'm going to debunk you in this journal or I'm going to write a, a popular magazine article showing why you're wrong. Why isn't that enough? I don't know why it's not enough, but it really doesn't seem to be enough anymore. And I was fortunate I wasn't fired because I I su filed suit before <laughs> they did that. I'm sure that that was, that was their next plan, but it wasn't enough. And I think that that's basically, that's one of the big differences with the cancel culture is that they want to destroy your, your life. They don't just want to just, you know, they just don't want to debunk you. But the other reason I think is because they don't have an argument, you know, in a sense, one of the things that I noticed in, in these four years since my book came out and what I talk about in my new book is how the, the new wave of political correctness or the wokeness is actually very much about personal attacks, ad hominem attacks, and not arguing that, you know, why I'm wrong so much, but rather arguing that I am bad or evil. Um, and so I think that when you've made the decision to say this person is bad or this person is evil, then you, you can't just disagree with them. 
you basically have to take them out of the environment. And I think that that's where the change went. And also because the argument almost always is coupled with you're causing harm, you are hurting people. And that was one of the things that the American Anthropological Association said about the talk about sex is that I'm, I was hurting people by bringing this up. And, um, you know, as opposed to um, this is why she's wrong, it's harmful. And therefore, she's not allowed to harm people by coming on the platform. Yeah, you had some other examples here. I dog-eared in the book here just to uh, punch home the point here. You're talking about a conference in November of 2022. Yeah, uh, at the American Anthropological Association in Seattle. Um, and you did a little kind of catalog of the different talks being presented there. For instance, nearly 80 sessions presented there used the word decolonization. Even more ridiculously, over 70 sessions used the term white supremacy. None of these sessions featured talks that were actually about white supremacy. There were no ethnographic studies of white supremacy group like the KKK. I penetrated them and they pre I pretended to be one of them. And here's what I found. <laughs> that would be interesting, actually. That would be interesting. I yeah. would go to that talk. <laughs> yeah. Two session titles that demonstrated the field's direction were, here's one, pronouns, bottoms, cat ears, and Coopers? Coopers? What is that? Coop Coopers? What yeah, I word? don't know. <laughs> oh, Coopers. Girl, or an intersectional translinguistic anthropology. I, I have no idea what this talk is about. <laughs> and the other one is unsettling queer anthropology, critical genealogies, and decolonizing futures. Again, I have no idea what that talk would be about. One of the things I think that has gone wrong with anthropology both cultural anthropology, physical anthropology, and archaeology, um, or all three of those, is that these topics are topics that the authors, the researchers, um, are interested in because it's about them. And the anthropology really is the study of others, whether that is another time period or a different uh, culture. And they, it seems that they can only understand others by, through their own lens. And that's why you get these kind of crazy um, topics and, you know, queer anthropology, uh, the queer archaeology lens, or the queer anthropology lens, um, and topics about these kinds of things. I thought what was interesting in that 2022 uh, conference also was how much self -anth anthropology of the self W uh, made an appearance. What I one of the talks I went to was um, this woman. Was, she's a new mother, and she during COVID, and she basically was joining mothers groups online, and so then she decided to make this her ethnography. So now you know there's there's something about participant. You know you can be a participant observer. But you can't just, you know, join your, the own, your own club that you belong to. It still has to be a little bit alien to you to, so that you can kind of have an almost a more objective view. Um, so, and so she went, she started going to this online group and it was all about um, ch teaching your child that it's okay to be um, have body autonomy and not forcing little toddlers to accept kisses from um prying grandmothers or aunts right <laughs> so like it's okay if your your child says no to a kiss from those people and one of the interesting things is when she when covid was winding down and she re-entered uh, uh, the non-family environment she noticed her child who was like three, right? Three or four, was um, didn't want to have a hug from a black person. And she panicked thinking, oh my goodness, my child is racist. And then the mother's groups were like, no, no, your child's not racist. And But this is what happens when you so internalize it. You can't be objective and say, you know, maybe my child's just, um, you know, I taught my child that it's okay to say no to hugs. He's coming across as what is a stranger to him and he doesn't want to hug from him. 
doesn't, you know, but she had internalized it and then blew this out of proportion. And this was her talk. Now, you know, this might be interesting psychology or, you know, self-help group, but it's not anthropology. Colin Wright's been posting on Twitter these papers that people get their doctoral dissertations on with an N of like three. I talked to three people and here's what I found. And that's yes. considered a doctorate in anthropology. Here's another example of your of the narcissism you're talking about. Uh, this is your description of this conference uh, in Seattle. Many speakers started their talks by describing themselves. <laughs> speakers would describe their hair color, skin color, what they were wearing, how tall they were, and of course their pronouns. Why would they do this? The narrative is that it's for the sight impaired. Uh, how many people sitting there in the audience that are blind? Okay. Uh, but in a sense, if you are providing information about other cultures that you study, what difference does it make if you're wearing a white shirt or a red shirt? The real reason for this performance is to ensure that you give proper deference to speakers from oppressed groups. A person of color needs to be listened to. A person's pronouns signal their virtue and thus the importance of their opinion. Ironically, these personal descriptions were sometimes wrong. Men tended to overstate their height. Really? I would never do that. <laughs> Neither would Nick. <laughs> I always tell people I'm 5'8", and I go, okay, I'm 5'7". I don't know why, I just lied. <laughs> I used to be 5'8", when I was in my 20s. I'm shrunk, shrunk a little bit. <laughs> and then some people got the color of their clothing wrong. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> and at other times, these descriptions were the most interesting things that people had to say, well, yes, <laughs> that's pretty bad. <laughs> yes, it was It was definitely an eye-opener. And I hadn't been to a conference conference in a while, not only because of COVID, but also because um, I had I had basically stopped going to quite a few conferences and just focused on research and writing and so forth. And then after COVID, I was like, you know, it might be fun to go to a conference once in a while, <laughs> you know, and it was definitely an eye opener. Yeah. But to your point, it's it's the narcissism of it. It's all about me. Whereas in old school anthropology, for all its flaws, at least you were supposed to purge your own biases and try to report objectively what it is these people were doing and thinking. And, you know, it's quite interesting. That's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I I'm, was attracted to, bio, uh, to anthropology um, it was the study of the other. The other thing is, you know, biological anthropology specifically is... The, the beauty of anatomy and of the bones. None of this was personal to me. And, you know, I've been, sometimes I've been um, criticized for studying Native American bones and been told, why, why don't you study your own people? Why don't you study your, you know, um, European remains? Well, I have, I have done so. I've studied skeletal remains from all sorts of um, populations, from Euro-Americans to uh, Quebec prisoners of war, to, to Native American remains. But those that are always most interesting are the ones that are most foreign to me because you learn so much more about others as opposed to just looking inside. If I want to learn about, you know, German, um, uh, you know, culture, I can ask my mother. <laughs> I don't need to study it in anthropology. And the thing is, like, you know, anthropology is supposed to, in some ways, um, you know, bring us together by learning about each other. And it seems like it's just gone off the rails from that perspective, whereas people are so encouraged to study only what, what's related to them. And ironically, some people, um, you know, are, are feeling pushed into areas that are not of interest to them. Um, I know uh, one of the speakers for, um, who came, who spoke at San Jose State when my uh, chair put on a uh, speaker series to combat my racist uh, views? Um, he was talking about how you know black students um, oftentimes don't want to just study Caribbean anthropology or Cuban anthropology. Sometimes they want to study the Vikings and they, and they should be able to. And so it's this kind of, you know, let your interests go where they may. And you shouldn't be judged uh, on whether you're studying something. Your validity shouldn't be judged 
on whether it's related to you or not. Yeah, you write here, I cannot believe that the curators and researchers actually believe any of these warnings, the warnings on the cases about uh, what these spiritual imbued objects might do to you. Uh, but they go along with it so they can still conduct research and exhibit materials. What is your sense about this whole woke, progressive, post, you know, modern, whatever, um, political correctness and so on? What percentage of people actually believe it? They're true ideologues, true believers. They've inculcated it into their worldviews. How many of them are just Machiavellian manipulators? They go, I know this is bullshit, but I got to say it so I don't get fired or so I keep my job and so on. Uh, and how many of them are just activists that just like to s stir shit up for the fun of it? Well, I think that there's going to be some overlap. <laughs> um, but I do think that mo most of them are just activists. They don't believe it. A small person, like maybe 50, 60 percent are activists um, and don't believe it. Maybe another 10, 15 percent believe it. Um, and then... Um, I would say then there's a split between the last 20, 30 percent who um, basically either completely don't believe it and are like, um, but I have to follow along to keep my job, to keep my uh, um, access to research and so forth. And a small percentage, maybe somewhere between five and 10, um, who don't believe it and speak out. Um, I, I get emails from, from researchers, from professors, curators, uh, um, who tell me that they don't believe it, but who say, don't use my name. Don't, you know, I, I'm on your side, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and so I, I always honor that. I, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I don't, I don't out people in that sense, but I think it's a real shame because what happens is when you, when you make such a call when you send such an email or you know whisper in the hallways what you're really doing is you're setting people up um like me for cancellation because you have no support um in the field now i had lots of support outside of the field i won't say i didn't and but like actual colleagues who are anthropologists um who are not retired <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a lot. Um, so I, I think that that's quite sad. And yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm as alone as people might think that I am in the sense that, oh, she has these weird ideas. Um, she actually just wants to study bones and, <laughs> and understand the past. Um, but basically, um, but a lot of people aren't speaking up. Yeah. Okay. Finishing up with your personal narrative. So when we when we last left our hero, <laughs> she was involved in a lawsuit with San Jose State, and then what happened after that? Well, basically, I settled my case, and I settled my case because um, throughout the whole throughout the whole ordeal, <laughs> um, I was fighting little battles like the menstrual uh, menstruating personnel. I had that removed like trying to get access to skeletal collections that are not um, Native Americans. And I did get a collection uh, after 10 months, a Carthage collection from Tunisia. And so I was, I was going along, fighting all these little battles and winning them, you know. Um, but the big battle about getting back into the curation facility, studying skeletal remains from Native Americans, or even the... Um, or even the uh, x-rays from these remains could not be worn and they couldn't be worn because of a catch-22 where you must include the tribes in your case because they're an indispensable party but they are sovereign and therefore cannot be sued so that's basically what i ran up against some other people who run up against this tim white from um UC Berkeley. Berkeley with his uh, interest in paleo Indians, same thing happened when he apply when he uh, sued to get access to some paleo Indians from La Jolla, um, so the UC San Diego campus. They basically dismissed the case because he could not include the Native Americans, but he had to. 
So this is what ha this is what I ran up against. And so what I ended up doing was I I settled the case. Um, and I would say that I got some things I wanted <laughs> and they got some things they wanted. Um, one of the things that I was able to do was come here to New York and, uh, you know, look at skeletal, uh, look at uh, collections and museums, trying to find a skeletal collection. But um, basically, museums are even worse than universities. I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, but I got to spend a year in New York investigating this issue. Um, I also um, am retiring. Uh, actually, I have retired. Uh, uh, I think my last day at San Jose uh, was, uh, or as a professor in San Jose was in um, May 29th or something like that, 25th or 29th, I can't remember exactly. Um, and, um, but upon retirement, I keep my emeritus status. So um, that was important to me. Um, so I got, I won some things and I, I didn't win others, right? So it's kind of a draw. Now, some people might say, well, why didn't I stay? You know, would I have been fired? I don't think after the, after the going to court and after the, um, all the legal things that I would have been fired. I think that they knew that I wasn't going to be pushed around and that they would have uh, backed off. But I would not have been able to study any skeletal remains beyond the Carthage collection, which is a very poorly preserved collection, unfortunately, which I did study. But, um, and I had always said that I don't want to stay if there's no collection to study. So one of the things I also tried to do was to um, argue that I should be able to use my data that I had already previously collected. And they vetoed that. And I said, you know, then I'm, I'm leaving, um, I'm going to retire and I'm going to look for, um, other, uh, other collections, but also be able to use my, the research that, I, uh, the data from research I've already done. Uh, I have, you know, a lot of data that they literally said I couldn't use. So are you losing your income? Uh, I'll be retired. So I'll be getting my pension, oh, right? Retirement, your pension. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You work for the state state of California, so you get a, yes. a, a pension. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. You can always write books, but as a book author, I can tell you that's a difficult way to make a living. <laughs> it is a difficult way to make <laughs> that's a living. For sure. <laughs> but um, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's look at some of the deep root causes behind all these movements. You know, if you look historically at how, let's say, Native Americans or the first peoples of Canada or Australian Aborigines were treated historically, it was pretty bad. Um, and so is part of the motive kind of a, I don't know if you want to call it white guilt or, or, or some Western guilt or something like, you know, we really did these people harm. Okay, you and I didn't do anything, but, you know, our ancestors did. And we need to do something to make up for it. Uh, I mean, what am I going to do? I mean, I live now, not 200 years ago, uh, but I can do something. Here's what I could do. I can march and protest. I can signal my virtue by, you know, land acknowledgments. By the way, does anybody ever propose giving the land back to any of these yes, tribes? Yes, Now, they now do? there is a move. There is a movement for land back movement in California. Yes, oh my absolutely. God. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How about Gavin Newsom? Give give the governor's mansion back to whatever yes. tribe lived in that area. Yeah. <laughs> you think that's going to happen? No, but I do think <laughs> they have like given like a small plots of land. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Back. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's good. At least mm -hmm. you have some uh, credibility to your word. But the point of that is that it's, I guess it's a way of saying, I'm sorry that these things happened. Yeah, I didn't you know, do it. It didn't happen to you, but historically. I I think that bad stuff happened to everybody at some point in, <laughs> yeah. in uh, history and prehistory. Um, I think that we cannot live our lives um, constantly trying to figure out how to atone for what other people did. I think we should know that history, but I don't think we should necessarily feel that we have to atone for it. Um, all of the collection at um, that, I was studying in San Jose, the Na Native American collection that I was studying actually was pre-contact. So uh, actually had never been harmed by <laughs> colonialists because they were pre-contact. And interestingly, um, 
their look, uh, the collection itself, the Ryan Mount collection, it spans about 2,500 uh, years. And um, it was once thought to be one population. And I did some research uh, on the collection because people were saying to me, people from other universities was like, are you sure this is one population? It just doesn't look like it but when with the metrics and so forth. And so I decided to do some research on it and, um, and basically found that it's very likely, extremely likely that this was more than one population and that the earliest population was actually um, invaded and wiped out by another pre-contact Native American population. So it's not like they, that there wasn't anything bad done before, but we don't ha have the tribe saying, well, you know, I should be atoning for what my tribe did to the previous tribe, right? <clears throat> this is just human history and human prehistory. And I think it's good to know about but it's not good to villainize one particular group and it's not good to uh, erase the science and scientific research in order to atone for past sins. Um, so I understand that reasoning, but I don't, I don't um, accept it as a reason for destroying anthropology. This collection that you curated, wh where were those bones originally found? Um, Alameda County, which is, um, you know, the Bay Area, but um, Southeast Bay about. Okay. The people there that want those bones back and, you know, reburied or whatever, how do you know or how do they know or what's their claim that they are connected to those bones that are thousands of years ago? I mean, maybe there were a dozen tribes that moved in and out of the area from different migrating groups. I'm pretty sure that they're not actually connected to those people um, maybe to the last part of the collection, the the most modern part of it, because as I say, it's you know it spans for a, quite a long time. But I'm I'm pretty sure that they're not um, they're not related to that collection. Um, but ironically, because that because that collection um, you know ha has been linked to one tribe, the Moak Maloney another tribe has now said, no, 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 it's not the, they're not related. It's us, the Amamutsun. And some people even say that the tribe that was most um, active against me, the Moak Maloney some people even say, some other Native American tribes even say that they're a fake tribe. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of intertribal warfare oh, going on. Oh, this is the uh, pretendians of your title? Right, right. So there are pretendians, there are Indians, there's, and there are pretendians. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't that what's her name's uh, claim? Uh, War, uh, Warren. Um, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, she was one sixteenth yes. Native American. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's um, you know, one of the things that people don't understand about repatriation and reburial, uh, and and the law is that. Actually, it was written in a way to allow for scientific research to continue. It was meant as a compromise. Many people saw that the compromise wouldn't hold, but it was meant for that. And therefore, basically, what you had was that the collections that were clearly attributable to a modern tribe were supposed to be repatriated and reburied. And I'm against that, too. But I, you know, I do see that that's a compromise. Um, and now, and those collections have already been repatriated and reburied. Um, almost all of them. And I th over 90% of them. And the reason why there are still skeletal collections in museums and universities is because they are not clearly affiliated with a modern tribe. Um, there are tribes who have gone extinct. There are, um, there are tribes who are new. So I think that this is something that is not fully made aware of. And in part because the tribe story is we've always been here. We were created here by this supreme being who put us on the bottom of the Bay Area or bottom of the Grand Canyon. And we have our specific creation myths. And that's one of the things that I was really fighting against is that this use of creation myth, which is just another creation myth, regardless of 
where it's coming from, whether it's the Adam and Eve creation myth or the Native American creation myth, and it holds no validity. Yeah. I always like these inconsistencies in the stories. Remember the Rachel Dolezal story from a few years ago? Okay. Yes. Jewish white woman pre that pretends, identifies as black, becomes the head of the NAACP in Seattle, and then gets outed by her own parents. <laughs> she's yes. not black, she's a Jewish white girl. <laughs> it's really funny. And the same thing happened with <laughs> Sasheen Littlefeather. Sasheen Littlefeather, of course, is a famous Native American who um, went to the Oscars in oh, the place of right. um, Marlon Brando. Right. And, once she, and her family is uh, Mexican-American, and um, they had said for years to her, what, why are you pretending to be Native American? And um, when she passed away, the sister came out with, with the truth. And I understand why the sister didn't out her. I understand, you know, like, uh, it would be a hard thing to do to do that to your family. Um, but it's interesting that with the Rachel Dozel, they did. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the follow-up on the Rachel Dolezal story maybe six months ago or so. No, she I was, don't think I did. She was outed. Uh, she was a school teacher, I think in Ohio, just some nothing school, like a grammar school or something. She just disappeared and blended into the society, became a normal person. But then she got outed um, because she was supplementing her teacher's income. Uh, I think it was on OnlyFans as a cam oh, girl. No. <laughs> now, when I tell this story, a lot of people don't know what a cam girl is, but basically you're in the privacy of your bedroom with the camera on and guys are watching and paying you to do your thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they fired her. Now, why do they have to fire? <laughs> That's another story. Why? Because all the dads are going to be looking at her differently yeah. now. <laughs> How did they find that one out? I guess that's, that's right. The principal <laughs> happened to run into this uh, yeah. video. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, God, our society has just gone so crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, before I let you go, I, I have a couple mm -hmm. other questions on just, just archaeological and the peopling of the Americas. As you know, I've engaged with Graham Hancock on a number of times in print uh, and in Joe Rogan's studio for four hours. As you know, Graham's thing is things are a lot older than they seem, right? Uh, Clovis first is gone. You know, stuff keeps getting older. He thinks there were the people in the Americas like 100,000 years ago or more. And, and so what's, what's the latest research show on that particular question? What's the earliest we can go back within, a, I guess, a like a air bar range of uh, of dates uh, for the people in the Americas? I would say between um, 14,000 and 20,000, maybe. Uh, would what about be those the, footprints that were found in New Mexico last year? Yeah, they, they were, were like 22,000, 20... yeah. I think. But there's been real um, questions about the dates because the dating technique that they used um, is one that oftentimes um, it over. Uh, it has a too old age, you know, so it has an error in that direction most frequently. Um, so, you know, maybe 25, if we're going to be very generous, you know, I don't actually, um, I don't actually have like a ideological position on it. I just think like, what do we, what data do we have that is very secure and what data we have that is very secure I think goes back about 14,000. Um, and then you have some data that is less secure, but is interesting, like the footprints that go, I think they are 22,000. So I would give it like be somewhere between 13 and, or 14 and 20,000, maybe 25,000. And that's pretty close. That's pre Clovis, right? Yeah. So, and you know, the thing, here's the thing, like I, I'm still waiting for that 20,000 year old skeleton and it hasn't been found. The oldest skeleton I think is um, about 12,900. Maybe there's one 13,000, but that's like the oldest. Um, and that, you know, so I know like some people will like, well, look at the artifacts so forth. Artifacts are much harder to date. Um, they are more objective in the sense like some people will say, oh, this is an artifact and this is not. Like in Monteverde, there's a lot of discussion over what is an artifact and what isn't. 
and Monte Verde in Chile is uh, 14,000 or 14,500. So if you get me a 100,000 year old skeleton, um, yeah, I'll, you know, with a well dated, you know, I'm more than happy to change my mind and, you know, I'd be thrilled, but I just don't see it. I don't see any evidence for it. I'm completely open to changing my mind, but I don't see anything, any evidence for it. And what, one of the interesting things is that, um, Lewis Leakey came to the U S and he looked and looked and looked, he really wanted an really old American and he was desperate to find something even 30,000 years old. He had ideas about uh, antiquity in America and he never found it. And I, I, and I mean, not, not like, you know, just one or two seasons, but literally decades and he never found it. And what's interesting, I read, um, I, I think it was Meev Leakey's biography that I read. And so Meev Leakey is a wife of Richard Leakey, who's the son of Louis Leakey. <laughs> um, and she said that one of the things that Mary Leakey, so Louis Leakey's wife, um, really lost respect for Louis Leakey because he was, had become so ideologically and obsessive about this ancient America that he was looking for. And he couldn't, he, he couldn't accept that there was no evidence for that yet. And he had become kind of um, uh, not as scientifically driven as she had thought he should be. And so I know that a lot of people, they want, they de so desperately want it that it's being driven by their ideology. Um, but, you know, as I said, if I'm wrong, I'd be, yeah, I'm more than happy to say, yeah, I was wrong. Thrilling discovery. But that's so I, interesting. I I've never, I've never heard that about Leaky. I would have thought that uh, Graham would have brought that up, but maybe because Leaky didn't find anything uh, and looked for so long. Yeah. Uh, well, like one of the examples, like the week I was on with, with Graham on Rogan, uh, was the week that paper was published in Nature uh, it, about that find in San Diego, outside of San Diego, of these mammoth uh, bones. And there were some rocks near the bones that look like they might be stone tools. You know, if you kind of squint and use your imagination, you could picture them as stone tools. And the bones were broken. The mammoth bones were broken in a way that looked like, you know, they're broken in the long way to get the marrow or something like that. Right. So this, and this was in nature because he knew I was going to complain about, you know, peer review. You got to have peer review. It's like, it's in yeah, nature yeah. right there. It's in nature. Come on, Shermer. <laughs> but then, you know, you look at it, you go, well, but you know, then there was a counter paper, that maybe the, there was a it was a housing project, and maybe the bulldozers ran over the bones and broke them that way, and and the stone tools, again, you know, they they don't look like those. Well, I have some right here. Uh, you, know, you know, they don't look like these, right? These are right. actual stone tools an archaeologist friend gave me. Uh, they don't look like that at all. They're just kind of these round, you know, rocks that you know maybe were chip, maybe not. That's what you're talking yeah. about. The you know the right. kind of the fuzzy area there. Yeah, and I I did see that article, and I was like, those don't look like stone tools to me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I like one of the things I like about um, physical anthropology, about bio, biological physical anthropology, is you know you don't get mixed up with a a, a bone. It's either a bone or not. <laughs> but with artifacts, um, I'm not. I was not convinced that those look like stone tools to me. Yeah. There wasn't yeah, any I mean, any symmetry to them. That's you know there wasn't you know it doesn't look like there was any thought put to to using them, to yeah. creating them. I mean, no one would look at this and go, "Well, that was actually accidentally eroded in a river." Right. 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 So, I mean, it has to be something obvious like this. It's a signal detection problem. When is it clearly a stone tool and or not? So this brings up kind of a philosophy of science question. You know, what do you do with anomalies? You know, I call it the residue of anomalies. There's always a residue of anomalies. No theory explains everything, and this is in all fields of science. What do you do with them? Well, I think that what you do with them is you you keep them on the shelf until more data gets uh, added, right? So, um, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why it's so important not to rebury bones or not to um, repatriate artifacts is because if there is something, you basically just have to wait to see if it holds up. New techniques will be discovered 
to for aging, for example, for um, determining the antiquity of something, um, new analyses of whether something has been chipped in a way, um, you know, things like that that we don't yet have can come in five, ten years. And but if we don't have the collection to study, then we're not going to be able to test it. And and um, testing, retesting, testing and adding more data when it arises is um is what's necessary but also the other thing is to ensure that people who disagree with that perspective take a look at the remain at the remains or artifacts to see that has that person's ideology um you know made them shape the um their conclusions and one of the things you see in a lot of anthropology now is that in in mainstream anthropology that is being done in order to agree with oral traditions um but in alternative uh, anthropology sometimes it's done to disagree with mainstream and yet in both cases you have to let the data um you know be the the storyteller and you have to uh constantly check your own biases i think yeah i've been ever since i've gotten to know graham i've been fascinated by the the kind of appeal he has so first of all he's a he's a really good writer <laughs> but this but it's more than that the story he and he has a british accent that also helps <laughs> <laughs> but the story he tells is is very romantic i mean it has this kind of <laughs> mythic level of gravitas to it this was ancient civilization lost civilizations you know, in the Ice Age and, you know, the whole history of your field is the history of these discoveries of lost civilizations that are just, I mean, they make for great movies and epic stories. Um, you know, how do you think about the, your, your own field in that way? Well, I, I think that you don't need to create um, fictional, fictional tales to tell a great story. <clears throat> and the, the artifacts and the bones we have tell such a fascinating story that we don't have to imagine something else. Um, one of my favorite, for example, is the mummies of, um, found in northern Alaska, the family of mummies that were found there that day to about, I think, 800 years ago, where the, one of the old women old 40 year old or so right <laughs> 40. so younger than me but um she you know this family died uh, from an avalanche um and one of the interesting things was that this woman she had had um infection of one of her main heart arteries she had kidney failure she had trichinosis parasites um from eating polar bear meat that wasn't well enough cooked and you know she overcome overcame all these different hardships um that we can tell from her bones because she's a mummy from her organs and then she dies this tragic way with an avalanche you know so out of the blue this is a, a fascinating story without having to pretend that well what is there underneath that that we haven't found? Yes, we should continue to look and hopefully find more such stories. But what we found so already is so fascinating that we just really need to tell the story from the data, and and in this case, mummy, right? So, um, and you know, there are so many examples like this. You know, Kennewick Man, a fascinating uh, skeleton, uh, really robust bones probably like between 35 and 45 years of age, um, had an, an a arrowhead embedded in his hip that healed, had broken ribs that had healed, um, was um, taller than most agricultural Native Americans that came after him. So we actually know that um, if you look at the Paleo-Indians, they have their have a higher height stature, which suggests better nutrition and health than 
when you get the adoption of agriculture, which then drops and then it come, goes back up. These are fascinating trends and fascinating individuals to study. Um, that's that's where the stories are. Wasn't and there I something that that, about him being an uh, I knew? Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of debate whether where he came from. So his his skull looked more more like the Ainu, which are the Japanese uh, indigenous, but his DNA actually lines up most with South American uh, indigenous populations. Whoa. And so, you know, did he come up from that? W was there a different direction? These are fascinating questions to ask. And so I don't think that we need to, um, you know, uh, create the fiction uh, yeah. or, or wonder, oh, what, has, what is being hidden? What is being um, hidden from us? as opposed to just looking at what it has been discovered and, and researching that more. I love that quote from Douglas Adams. Isn't it enough to appreciate a garden without having to believe there's fairies living at the bottom of it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Great quote. Yeah, yeah. But, but what I'm getting at with your field, archaeology, there's a, almost a sense of roots writ large. You know, what is, who am I? Where did we come from? You know, what are our deep, deep ancestors? People love their genealogy. I mean, there's so many of these companies and organizations and, and DNA testing uh, groups. They, I mean, there must be a demand for it. People want to know. And so what you do is in a way saying, you know, roots writ large. Let's look at our deep, right. deep roots going back thousands of years. Yes. And I think that some people are hopeful um, that their roots, m maybe because of the um, romantic narrative, um, that the roots of non-Native Americans are here in the in the Americas. Um, so, you know, ancient European population who came over 100,000 years ago. <laughs> um, but um, I just don't think, I don't think that there's clear evidence for that. Um, I think that it is likely that, you know, there were multiple migrations. I do think um, that some came over the Bering Strait, some didn't. Um, they came from multiple places. But I don't think See anything that suggests right now a hundred thousand years or even fifty thousand years, and I don't see anything that suggests right now a real like European look, right? So, um, Spirit Cave is a, a mummy <clears throat> that was found in Nevada that's about nine thousand to ten thousand years old, now reburied, of course. But um, this is he's a mummy because of the Nevada's aridity, right? So he was desiccated and he had some remaining hair, you know, head hair that was preserved and it's kind of reddish. And so some people said, oh, you know, this, it was he European, he had red hair. Well, one of the things we know is that uh, hair changes color over time as it loses certain minerals, as it absorbs other minerals. And so oftentimes you'll go from an individual who has had very brown hair or black hair and to a kind of a red hair um, given enough time in mummies. So that, that's interesting of itself that, you know, and helps us understand, you know, that sometimes what we see and we think, oh, that, this is European, it might not be, <laughs> you know, we have to take these things into consideration. Whereas, like, if you look at some of the earliest, um, some early mummies in, um, like, Western Mongolia um, that the Chinese government has been trying to hide, they're like, I think they're about 3,800 years old, if I'm not wrong. Um, they do have blonde hair, not red hair, but blonde hair. And they do look very European with the bridge nose and so forth, which does suggest that some Euro European populations were moving also perhaps east and not just west. So I mean, there are all sorts of fascinating stories, but I think you do need to tell it with the evidence. Um, and, and wherever one's roots are, you know, if you go back far enough, we're all from Africa, but if wherever one's roots are, um, it's not, you know, having roots in the Americas versus Europe or the Americas versus the Middle East. It's not, one's not better than the other. 
By the way, I, I found in my closet uh, a while back a T-shirt I got from Richard Dawkins maybe 20 years ago that said, we're all Africans. I thought, oh boy, I wouldn't wear that now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Who's this white guy I think he is identifying as an African? <laughs> what about but the uh, kelp highway hypothesis? That, uh, I, uh, I, that's always fascinating because I live here in Santa Barbara. I can look right out on the Channel Islands and, you know, it just seems like it's a lot easier to take a boat down the coast and the, and the seafood is quite good. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it's better I, I than actually, weed whacking through the bushes all the way down. I actually think that the kelp highway was definitely one of the routes. Um, I think th there's good evidence for that because some of our earliest remains are on the coast. Um, and the other thing is that um, if they had made boats, um, it, um, it probably was made from an, a things that don't preserve. And we do know that humans must have made boats um, to get over to Australia um, and certain uh, other locations that never were land bridged. So that we do have, you know, there's, there would be no other way in a sense. Um, and the kelp, um, the kelp highway um, would have provided a lot of nutrients. Um, and the coast wasn't frozen. Right. So um, which would give it, uh, which would eliminate the very tight um, timeline that you would need going across. So if it was, I, I think it, that that's it, good. And if they came down the coast one of those earlier dates, like say 11, 12, 13, 14,000 years ago, how much lower would the sea level have been? Oh, I think it would have been quite quite a bit lower. I'm not 100% sure how much lower, but the one of the arguments is that um, a lot of the sites have been, have been um, underwater. And there are some sites that have been discovered that are underwater. So... Um, yeah, so it would have been enough to give you room to inhabit the coast. Is underwater archaeology still a thing? Yeah, actually, um, I, um, one of my colleagues, um, does underwater archaeology, um, and it's quite, um, quite fascinating. I would be scared. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going into this like cave very, with, with half an hour yeah, of oxygen. Yeah, oh, I'm not... <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, Ooh, those guys. Yeah. That's the Indiana Jones character of your yes, uh, of your field. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All right, Elizabeth, this is great. I I could go on for hours with you. I love uh, archaeology. I took an archaeology class in I don't know. I think it was the early seventies. Yeah, seventy three maybe. Anyway, fascinating stuff. Yeah, uh, for sure. D does have a very romantic past, also. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These kind of adventurous characters out there with their helmets and. And guns and clubs and gloves and all that stuff. Yes. <laughs> Crazy. A lot more technical now. I mean, really. Right, for a right. It's PhD really become now. A you really science. have to have a lot of chemistry and and all this, right? Right. Yeah. Anatomy, it's really become a, a, a science. And the other thing is that archaeology, physical anthropology, um, like, uh, you know, bioarchaeology have really been um, married together much more recently. Um, the study of skeletal remains in the archaeological record, but also this then has fed into forensic anthropology, and you have even forensic archaeology, archaeologists who t um, use their methods of excavation at forensic sites. So this is all um, intertwined in a fascinating way. <laughs> CSI archaeology, CSI prehistory. That's you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.